Hello and welcome to the Persuasion Lab podcast. I'm your host, Moeed Amin, and welcome to the show today. And the purpose really for this show is uh, we're here to the, discuss the future of sales and persuasion as a whole. So whether you are in a sales profession or any profession where persuading people to come with you along the journey is vital to your success, then this is the show for you. We don't just talk about theories and concepts here. We bring on people on show that can actually talk about the science and the research and real facts behind the premise and disciplines and principles that they share with us. So we'll have people from all walks of life and all expertise areas, people from body language to even functional medicine to personal branding, you know, everything that is important in order for you to be a holistic and functional persuader. And one of the things I've been talking about recently with uh, quite a bit of the community and the community have been talking to me about and sharing with me is the area of sales enablement. And you know, how can we have a sales enablement support in our businesses that takes us to the next level and support our own growth? And that's why I'm excited to have our next guest here on the show today. Um, he's someone that's been in sales enablement space for over 14 years and co-founded a company called Flow State, and they specialize in working with B2B sales professionals. Um, he was voted one of the top 20 sales enablement influencers in the world, and he's helped thousands of sales managers and professionals, both in large and startup companies, really take their sales skills to the next level. He's also helped take an HR tech business IPO in 2014. So this person comes with an incredible amount of experience. So please help me welcome someone who is also uh, a qualified coach in NLP and neurosemantics, uh, Mr. Aaron Evans. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Big, big fan of your work, Marie. So uh, really excited about this conversation. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. And, and, and likewise, really really love what you're doing and, and seeing the impact that you're having uh, for salespeople and sales enablement as a profession as a whole and, and, a, and, and a function that's really important to, to any business that takes sales seriously, particularly in B2B. So why don't we, why don't we start off with, the, with uh, a question that, what is your definition of sales enablement? Because different people have different perspectives of what that is and, and certainly the responsibilities that sales enablement has. It's a really good question. And I think partially for the fact that it's a relatively new function in the grand scheme of business, right? I think it's, it's probably only really been around for about 10 years in its purest form. And like all these things, it started in the US with tech and SaaS businesses, and then it slowly bleeds into other countries and cultures. I, I like to basically phrase it in its simplest form to strip away all the nonsense and just to give you a one liner of what sales enablement exists for its very purpose. And it's pretty simple. It's designed to set salespeople up for success. So what does that mean? So let's let's sort of zoom out and look at what that actually means. So if you imagine that you've got these all these other functions that sit on the periphery of commercial function or the sales organization. So you've got the product team, which is creating fantastic product. You've got the product marketing team that's distilling the message and making it clear for people who want to see the value in what it is that they're creating. You've also got the marketing team. You've also got the strategy team. You've got all these different teams and what sales enablement does, it becomes a conduit between all those teams and the sales organization. So it's very function is designed to take these messages, these complex ideas, these products, these services, distill it down into a way that something is functionable and usable for the sales organization. A really simple example of that is that if you've got a, a new product being released, you don't want to sit there in front of a product guy and then to talk to the sales organization, because as we know, they're probably getting into excruciating technical detail. They'll probably, you know, obviously show you all the bells and whistles and the feature and the function and the salesperson sitting there scratching their head going, well, how do I translate this to my audience, to my prospects? So what the sales enablement function does is it comes up with the key benefits that this product ultimately delivers, the outcomes it delivers, the problems that it solves, the right questions to ask, to elicit those from the customer. And again, it's designed to set the sales organization up for success. One last thing I say about this is, and it's a really hot topic in, in our industry of sales enablement or in our sector of sales enablement, is that if you imagine how sales enablement was born, it probably started with trainers or, or sales trainers in businesses. And also there's the operation side of the business as well. So these teams that are set to set up the technology and the systems and the processes the sales, for salespeople to succeed. And slowly but surely they fused together and became sales enablement. The biggest challenge facing sales enablement at the moment is where they sit on that spectrum of front end delivery and then back end build. And the Great White Buffalo is a sales enablement organization that can do both. 
It can build the uh, processes, the systems, the functions that are designed to help the salespeople succeed. And then they've also got a strong front end arm, which is translating it for the sales organization, training them, coaching them, developing them, making them better every single day. And the problem is, is that businesses often sit in either one side of that spectrum. So the sales organization goes, this is great, but I can't use it. Or I'm just getting loads of training. Uh, I want to learn more about how this is actually going to help me and support me and enable me in my day to day role. That makes a lot of sense. And you describe that in a lot of detail. I, I do want to talk about the future of sales and sales enablement. But before I ask that, one question that came to mind when you were describing the spectrum and you know what really sales enablement is about, one question that came to mind is, when is it the right time for a company to consider having a sales enablement function? It's a question I get asked probably five or six times a day, to be honest with you. Um, so let's, let's play out two scenarios. There's the ideal scenario, which is the first hire you make commercial hire you make is someone in sales enablement because they've got the technical expertise to build the foundations of a really humming sales engine so what happens in lieu of that well businesses turn around and go well we're going to hire a sales manager and the sales manager has no expertise in building out these functions so they kind of make it up on the fly but what they're actually doing is they're knitting in best practice uh, knitting in some of the worst practices and then using that as a groundwork to go and scale which is impossible then you become debilitating in the way that you scale because you've got bad processes in place but that's completely unrealistic and uh, no one would ever hire sales enablement as their as their first um their first commercial hire i think for me is when you've got an established sales team and then you're looking for your next level of growth for two reasons right is that with scale you have to build the sausage machine not the sausage right so you want something that's repeatable predictable actionable and obviously can, can support the scale as well. So if you plug another 10 salespeople in there, the, the system's not going to creak and break, right? Uh, if you're moving into a new region or you've got new products coming out, it's a really good kind of catalyzing event that can do that, uh, which, is, which is obviously very, very important. The other thing to think about is actually funding, is that more and more when, uh, you know, investors are looking into a business, they're actually asking questions about the enablement that's in the business as well. Because they're thinking, well, if I'm about to give you, you know, two, three, four, five hundred million pounds, I want to make sure that that money is being invested into creating scalability. And to do that, you need to have an enablement function that's going to create the foundations for scale as well. So there's two catalyzing events there, which is when the logic of growth is, you know, new product, new market, new geography, or you've got a potential round of funding coming up and you really want to make sure that investors are looking in and they realize that their investment's safe as well. So they're, they're two really good use cases for sales enablement. So the thing that I struggle with that is, a lot of founders these days, particularly those that come from a tech background or subject matter background, have either no understanding of sales or a very warped understanding of what good sales looks like. And to me, if they don't understand sales, I don't think they would understand sales enablement. They will understand sales enablement even less. So what challenges do you face in talking to those founders about sales enablement and why it's so important or how should they what should they know about sales enablement, which makes the case for them? I think you've, you've both diagnosed and prescribed in your question, which is bedroom founders who are product people. It's not that they don't get sales. They understand the commercial arm of sales. What they don't get is sales culture, right? So mm. what do I mean by that? Well, a product person, if they were talking to a sales organization, they'd create a 300 page document for the sales team to read and not realize that no one will ever read it. And in fact, if everyone was to read it, the amount of money it would cost the business for them just to read it would be completely and utterly outweighed of the document itself. What you need to convince them of is that this product that you've built in your bedroom that you're so proud of, you've got to translate that into something that's commercial and actual, actionable for the people who are going to buy it. Sales can't do that. They can't do it on their own. You need to help get someone in there who's going to help get all that wonderful stuff that's in your head and translate it to the sales organization so they armed with the right tools and content and skills to go and do precisely that. Actually, the bigger challenge is not the, the commercial arm getting it nowadays. I actually think it's sales enablement understanding sales culture. Because so many people from sales enablement have come from an ops background, they don't understand what it's like to sit on the cold face, have 100 tabs open, dealing with different types of customers at different stages of the pipeline. And how you need something that's quick and easy to access to help you learn and make that next move in the way that you're influencing opportunities or, you know, bringing a new product to market as an example. But again, like let's let's go back to this is that anyone who is a bedroom developer or even someone who's got an established business, 
the typical next step for them is where they're getting their next round of funding from. So you've got to convince them that the first stage is actually getting customers to use your product, which is the, the, you know, the validation of the actual concept itself. The next stage is that you want to convince them that actually getting people to buy your product again once their subscriptions run out or, you know, if it's a monthly thing, is really what investors are looking for. Proof of concept, great. You might get Series A out of that or, or even seed funding. But when you're convincing them that actually people are coming back to buy your product again the next year or the next month, that's when actually you can start asking the market for more money to invest in your product. And also people see it as being a, a de-risked and viable investment that they need to make. So again, it's about speaking the language of the, of the, of the owner of the business, the CEO or the co-founder, and letting them know that this journey to raising revenue and raising money to invest back in the business, it starts with the sales organization. And if you haven't got the foundations in place to let them scale or let them you know, create predictable, repeatable business, you're in big, big trouble. That money will dry up and you'll burn it through it very, very quickly. And you'll make big mistakes. You'll know this better than anyone, right? Is that look at the typical mistakes that businesses make with their sales organization. Well, we're going to hire a head of sales who's got no experience of doing this. Or we're going to plug another 200 people in there. And all you're doing is scaling bad practice. Or, you know, you, you, you get it where it's like, well, we're going to open three new regions or a new region. You plug a load of people in there and all of a sudden there's no foundation in place for them to succeed. And you just can't do that in modern business. You, you can't get away with it. So do sales leaders get the importance of sales enablement as well? When it's in place, they get it very, very quickly. When it's not in place, they sit there pulling their hair out saying, I've got to do all this stuff. Um, I think if you could grab any manager now and say, actually, there's four things we want you to focus on. Number one, we want you to inspire your team. So every day their head springs off the pillow and all they care about is working for you. Number two, we want to inspire the values of the company. So not do they just not want to work for you, they want to work for the company as well. I want you to improve them every single day and get them 1% better. Oh, and guess what? We need you to report on all that as well. They're the four things we need you to do as a manager. Everything else is, is peripheral and not, not of any value at all because that should sit with the enablement function. But that's not what we ask of sales leaders nowadays. We ask them to do a load of stuff that's not within their defined skill set or competency, uh, competency framework. And then when they fail it and they're poor at it and their time's taking up stuff that's not important, that isn't driving revenue outcomes or improving their team, we sit there and we castigate and we, and we, and we, we have a go at them. 68% of sales leaders missed their target in August this year. It's crazy, right? Mm. Absolutely crazy. Why is that? Well, we're getting them to concentrate on stuff that isn't driving revenue outcome. Grab any manager and ask them where you're spending most of your time. It will be on things that aren't driving revenue outcomes. So yeah, they see the value in sales enablement very, very quickly when they understand what it is. I mean, that's a large number, 68% of sales managers. You said that 68% in August. So August this year, yeah. Do you, do you feel, why do you feel that's the case? Do you, do you really feel it's because they're focusing on things that um, are not important versus things that are external that is having a, a, a kind of disproportionate impact i mean i i i personally feel that we're always in control of how we deal with things but sometimes external things can come and knock us mm. what are your thoughts as to why that's happening do you really think it's just because of the fact that they're focusing on things that are not important or more to it i don't think it's the only reason i think there's an amount of reasons i think i think that that's definitely a reason and look you know I, when I go into businesses, one of the first things I do is speak to the sales management cohort and you learn very quickly how much time is being wasted and how they see it as well. They, they see this, that their time is being eaten up by stuff that's not important. The, the classic thing is that they're being asked for numbers. And if, if, if you're constantly being asked for numbers and reporting as a manager, it's not the manager that's broken, it's your CRM that's broken. Anyone should be able to access any information on a dashboard at the click of a button. Uh, and that's sales ops and, and obviously the support of enablement through that as well. Look, sales is getting harder and salespeople are getting worse every single day. The buyer is evolving quicker than salespeople. I, I liken it to drugs, cheats in sports, where a new drug comes in the black market and they start taking it and getting amazing results, these drug cheats. And the, the, uh, the testers can't even test for it because they don't even know what the drug is. And then they finally catch up to it. And by the time they've caught up, new drugs on the market. And it's exactly the same with what's happening in buying and selling at the moment. The buyer is evolving far quicker than the salesperson and the sales organization. And all that's happening is, is that we're consistently pissing buyers off every single day. And we're not listening to the buyer. And we're not observing our own buyer behaviors and then translating that into, into how, how uh, we service our customers and prospects. 
you're singing my song there, Aaron. Uh, that's something I, in fact, I actually say on my posts and in my communication, you're pissing buyers off because buyers have used those exact terms with me in my interviews uh, with them. So I get, I get what you're saying there. So why don't we talk about that future? Because in the beginning and early on in our discussion, you talked about the fact that sales enablement is there is to uh, help sales people become the best version of themselves. Right? That's, I'm paraphrasing. What do you see as the future of sales in order for them to become that best version of themselves? You know, How is sales changing? How is the buyer changing? What does that mean to what they need to do in order to be the best of themselves? And what does that mean to sales enablement? It's, it's a really interesting question, right? So if you think about the journey of the buyer, not the salesperson, because it has to start with the buyer. Over the last 15, 20 years, the, the way they buy has changed dramatically, right? And there's a couple of reasons why. So historically, like when you and I first started selling mode, it was like we, we held all the information. So if someone ever came to us, it was because they needed help with what to buy and what the problem is. So because we get, kept that information, we were valuable in that process. But if you look at it now, the salesperson is getting involved much, much later in the buying process for the simple fact that everyone has the information at their hands. Like if I wanted to go and buy a, I don't know, something as ridiculous as a CRM, I could go online, I could learn everything there is to know about CRMs, who's in the market, who's good, who's bad, why I should buy them, what the service is, what the features are, what the functions are. And I can have a pretty informed decision of three or four that I want to look at. So by the time I speak to a salesperson, I'm, I'm really informed. So what does that mean? Well, Buyers are coming in and they know more, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're knowing the right things. It doesn't mean that all the information they have at hand is the right information. So the role of the salesperson now is actually to guide the, the, guide the prospect through the buying process and actually enable the decision as opposed to try and let them know that they need to make a decision. I look at it like when you go into a supermarket and there's those automated checkouts and then you put something through and it goes, you know, oh, there's an unexpected item in the bagging area. And then a human being comes in and then they help make it easy for you. They take the pain away. They let you click through and then it goes into your basket and you purchase it. This is what the role of the salesperson is becoming. By the time they speak to someone, they need to basically take away all of the white noise, let them know what's important, aid them in purchasing that product and guide them to a decision to buy your product. Now, so much modern research has been done on this where 53% of opportunities are ending in no decision. So this is not the prospect deciding to buy something else. They're just deciding to buy nothing at all. This is because the vast amount of information that's available to them, it's too much information. There's too many signals. You know, it's like looking for a needle in a needle stack, right? So what the salesperson can do now is they can help the prospect make sense of that information, curate that information in a way that they're supporting the decision, de-risk the decision for the prospect, but also give them access to the information that they can't find on the internet. And that is customer information of your customers who you're working with now, customer insight. So the salesperson now needs to turn around to the prospect and say, would you like me to tell you how our customers are using this? Would you like me to tell you the three questions that customers ask when it comes to making a decision around this? Would you like me to give you some insight into how customers have dealt with this problem in the past? Because they can get the rest of the information online. So the salesperson now has evolved from what was a someone who was educating the prospect and giving them a load of information to now actually helping them make sense of the information. And we've got to set sellers up to do that far better with far more empathy than we're doing at the moment. So you talked about one example there, which is, you know, telling them about how customers are using their tools, right? Or their solution. But that's still quite self-serving in some way. I'm not I'm sure that's not how you were describing it, but how how would salespeople start to do that? Because there's a lot there, and I agree with you, by the way, but there's a lot there that salespeople either don't know how to or are not equipped to do so. I want to really give some of our viewers and listeners some, some really actionable things here. How can they start going about doing those things? It's a really good question. Well, first of all, it's about how the function is building out the right customer stories to tell to the right type of customer. And that comes from understanding the UK, use case intimately, and having a list of customers and a list of you know, questions to ask to elicit that in the prospect to help them know they'd be risking a decision. The other thing is that if you read the works of Matt Dixon, who's the author of The, uh, the Challenger Cell, his new book, The Jolt Effect, is really practical in how you can help the customer overcome that indecision in the first place. So the J stands for judging the indecision, right? So actually understanding that when someone isn't there, isn't making a purchase, they're actually worried about the risk as opposed to 
the status quo that they're in at the moment being a better decision. Now, the statistics around this are crazy, right? If you've got a customer who is at risk, it feels that the decision purchase, the purchasing decision is, is a risk, and we go back to try and sell them harder on the value of our product, that jumps from 53% of an indecision to 84% of an indecision. So it goes up higher when we go back and sell to them. We shouldn't be trying to continually sell to them. We should be stopping them and help them understand that it's not a risk that they're taking. So we need to de-risk it for them. So that's the first thing we can do is we, we need to understand whether the customer is realizing that it's a risk in the first place. So what does that mean practically? Well, when you're qualifying now, particularly in the last 15, 20% of the deal, what you're qualifying on is actually the reason why the deal slowed down. And you're trying to understand if it's because the prospect feels that they're taking a risk. And then we intervene and we can run a playbook and how we actually de-risk it for the prospect. And that could be several things, right? And it's not selling to them harder and it's not giving them more information. That's just going to increase the risk. It's coming up with terms that make them feel like it's de-risked. It's actually navigating them to the right information, not more information, helping them see the right information that's in front of them, curating the information for them. And then that then de-risks it. It's about how we give recommendations. Like we should be giving expert recommendations to our prospects. We shouldn't be going, here's three options, tell me which one you want to pick. We should be sitting there in the whites of the eyes and saying, this is the least risky option for you and what you're looking to achieve. Let's not go for the big all bells and whistles option. Let's go for the smaller one. And if you feel that it's valuable, we can then talk about how we can start servicing the rest of your business. That's what prospects want to hear. And that's what's taking the risk out of the prospect's hands. That makes complete sense. Everything that you just said makes sense. There's one an underlying thing in there that I think needs to be addressed, which is whether the buyer should trust what that salesperson is saying, right? Because you talked about in the old days where you know, we, we were the purveyors of that information. We were the conduit of that information. Now we're not. In fact, we're a very small part of all the information that they have available to them. And people are naturally going towards that information that they perceive to be more reputable or more trustworthy. Yeah. Even, even if we talk about those things, which I totally agree with you, by the way, which is how do we actually tell them about risk? Because that's part of the decision-making process. Yeah. How do we, when we give them options, we don't just say A, B, and C. We say, here is A. Here is B, here is C. Here's what A will give you versus B versus C. Here are our recommendations, and this is why. But that can only work if the buyer trusts you as a reputable and authoritative and trustworthy source of information. So how can salespeople become that in order for such messaging to really land powerfully? Really good question. And the answer is um, one that salespeople are going to fear because it's a panacea. there's no panacea for this, right? There's no bullet and going you're now a trusted advisor right so let let me play out a scenario for you right and i'm going to start with a statistic 84 percent of executives check linkedin before they make a purchasing decision yeah so so all of a sudden we're seeing here, here right is they're willing to make a purchasing decision they now to your point want to go and verify they're making it uh through linkedin so here's the question i have for every single salesperson listening to this now do you spend 15 to 20 minutes a day posting your opinions on linkedin connecting with the right people, sharing what you deem to be useful insight, sharing information about not, not just information, but more importantly, your perspectives on things. And do you do that every single weekday for two to three years? Look, the reason that we, you and I are chatting now is because that's precisely what I've been doing over the last maybe four years of my life. Uh, to the point now where I, 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 in my business, I've never made an outbound call. I've never sent an email to anyone. People come to me because they perceive me to be a source of truth, someone who's got some, what I believe are interesting opinions. And on top of that, uh, the key point here is a trusted advisor, someone who's willing to, you know, ult ultimately I carry credibility in the marketplace. Now, again, this is the change in sales that we need to have, right? You're not this big outbound engine that's sending millions of emails and calls into the market. There's always going to be a time and a place for that. But actually the push mechanism is not as valuable as the pull mechanism nowadays. You're going out and you're building a brand for yourself, a personal brand through your social channels. And people are, are really, what you're saying is really resonating with your audience. When it comes to them speaking to someone, they'll speak to you. The chances of you now creating something out of nothing, where you happen to call the right person, you happen to educate them on a problem, you happen to have access to their budget, you happen to be speaking to the same person, you happen to convince, happen to convince the organization they need to make a change, and you happen to convince all of the key players in that that you're the right product. It's almost impossible to do that nowadays. 
what you need to do is really attract that 3% of the market that are looking to make a purchase. And you do that through building credibility through your social channels and becoming a voice in those social channels as well. So again, it's not, it's not a kind of flick the switch and then good news, you're now an expert salesperson. It's actually getting ahead of where the market's moving if you start doing that today. I love that answer. And, and I had a couple of personal brand experts come on the show to share their perspective and their advice about how salespeople can start to do that in, in, in a way that is authentic to them as well, right? Because authenticity, authenticity is like the first kind of channel towards trustworthiness, uh, at least in my research. One thing that we did discuss that and the question I would like to pose to you, which is, and I have, I feel sales enablement would have a very strong part to play in something like this, which is there is a natural fear or there's a common fear that businesses have where, uh, you know, if you tell, if you tell a company that you want their salespeople to start posting things on LinkedIn, the first thing they think in their mind is just a bunch of salespeople going rogue and saying something that's going to affect our brand. Yeah. Um, and so what they, what they then do is they just say, look, marketing have created this. All we want you to do is just share it. Yeah. Don't put any commentary. Don't do, don't say anything about it. Just share it. It's enough for you. But actually we know that that doesn't actually build your brand as a salesperson, right? Uh, you're just a peddler of information that you haven't even created. So how have you seen companies in the best way facilitate salespeople to, to be able to share even things that have been created by marketing, but to add their own perspective to it, which then, in, which then kind of elevates their trustworthiness with the readers and the buyers? It's all about opinion, right? So first of all, this, the organization does not own the personal brand of the, of the, of the salesperson. That, that's not their job. The other point is the conflict between marketing want you to sell this, whereas your audience doesn't want you to sell this. So this shouldn't be a, here's a new feature that's come out. It's brilliant. Have a look at this. Amazing. No one cares. No one, no, no one gives a shit, right? What we're trying to do is distill what it does into something that's interesting and actionable for your audience, but also infused with your opinions on it, right? And the first thing we do is, is that you, as hard as it is, you've got to learn about your sector. You've got to form opinions about your sector. So we typically tell businesses to go and look for the, first, the five biggest mega trends that are affecting your sector at the moment, sit down in a room and argue for literally hours around these mega trends and actually start having your opinions crafted and changed and shaped by the way other people are discussing these as well. So straight away, you start thinking about things differently versus here's a white paper from marketing, have a look at it and share it, right? When you form these opinions, we want you now to actually go and articulate these opinions to people, but also articulate them to what other people are saying as well. So don't just post yourself, go and have conversations with people, spark some debate in their comments about how you think and feel about things. So straight away, what you're doing is, is you're encouraging people to actually have opinions, but also encouraging them to change those opinions if they do evolve along the way as well. And that to your point, the statistics around this are crazy, that something shared by a salesperson or sorry, not a salesperson, shared by a personal brand has eight times more engagement than shared through a company, company channel. Right. But this is the key point is that no one trusts companies, but everyone trusts people. And you, the, the biggest thing you've got in your armory at the moment is that you are a human being. And that's the key to selling is that you are a human being. So first of all, it's about defining those opinions. But then it's about little and often consistently talking about the things that are associated with that. So with that comes learning. So you have to make sure that you've got a feed set up where you're getting information about your industry. You're you know, getting the information through for market and product marketing, and you're talking about this stuff. But then there's the golden rule of this is that you never, ever ask for anything. Not under any circumstances do you ask for anything. The quickest way of killing credibility is asking for things. You actually want to do the opposite. You want to give as much as you can. Give insight, information, white papers, reports, anything that you think your, your industry, uh, your, 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 sorry, your audience is going to deem valuable. Give it all away for free. Give everything, literally everything, including the cow give it all away. Very, very quickly, you'll become a trusted source of information and at least someone who's got some opinions on this. And that's the key, is that you're, you're, you're carrying some credibility for your opinions. That's giving away everything will run contrary to how a lot of salespeople are trained and, and what's been taught to them. In fact, it actually probably runs contrary to some company leaders as well, right? 
my understanding from you is that actually you just create a delineation. You create a separation between sales process where you're asking for their time, but you're obviously giving value and telling them why versus building your brand, which is you're just giving. You're not asking for anything in return. Is it as simple as just being very clear mentally on what the role is based upon the outreach process or based upon what it is that you're communicating and the purpose for it? Or is there more to it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the best way of thinking about it actually is to, to not change your perspective on your pipeline, but to change, change your perspective on the tool you're using, right? So LinkedIn's not a marketplace. You don't sit there, set up your little stall and then, you know, start selling your jams and your chutneys. You'll be out of place on LinkedIn if you're doing that. LinkedIn is a party, right? And when you're at a party, who do people want to talk to? Interesting people, maybe controversial people. Maybe people who have, you know, opinions on stuff that you agree with or disagree with. That's what LinkedIn is. Now, as soon as they enter your funnel and they reach out to you and they say, hey, this is really interesting. Can you show us how you do this? The delineation is there. They're now in your funnel. It's a case of going, well, look, before we even enter this, do you want me to talk to you what our process looks like so you understand what the next two, three, four touch points are going to be? Because now they're in your funnel. Before that, they're just at the party. If they ask you for your telephone number, then that's a different story. The things start changing. I like that. I like that analogy. I haven't, heard, I haven't come across that before, marketplace versus party. That was really clear, actually. We have, a, we have a few minutes left, and there was a topic I really wanted to discuss. And I know we can't discuss all of it in a few minutes. It's a very big one, but it's one that I think is really important, in my opinion, to sales enablement. And you tell me if, if I'm misguided here. And, and that's the, the area of coaching. Mm. Um, you know, there is so much information out there as to why coaching is effective, right? And I can, we can offer two, two stats just from, from here, but there's so much more, you know, CEB, you know, which is now Gartner, you know, they found that effective coaching, you know, contributes 19% extra lift in terms of sales effectiveness. And there's also a stat that you've shared as well, for every dollar that's spent, that's invested in coaching, set, you get a $7.9 percent, sorry, $7.9 return. Right. So, so we know from so many instances that coaching is so important and very powerful and it's absolutely something you should invest in. And yet, from my observation, I'm still seeing that coaching is either not taken seriously or the approach is not well thought out and therefore it has, uh, you know, it doesn't have the right impact. If anything, it might have a negative impact. How do you see coaching being done effectively in companies you know what is the anatomy of a good coaching culture and process and approach it's a really good question well the first thing we do is we we ask people to re reframe the way they think about coaching so coaching isn't a, isn't a moment like you don't go right let me jump in my office i'm going to coach you coaching is a language so the first thing we have to do is is convince people to speak the same language which is, which is coaching, it's the first thing we do. And then the, the more critical piece of this is that we then enable the skill in the right people. Because, um, well, actually, let me finish this thought first. So if you wanted to train a manager to coach, you have to train them, you have to invest in the training. So you train them to coach, you certify them on coaching. So they're now up to the standard that you deem is, is, is right for your organization and they can now coach. And you, you don't have to just do that with sales managers. You can actually do that up and down the chain of command as well, right? If you really wanted to. Um, and on top of that, if you've identified a cohort of future leaders, why would you not start putting them on a coaching program where you train them how to coach? And then you observe them coaching. So you watch them coach in their organization. You watch them run deal reviews, part reviews, at desk coaching. And then you assess the coaching on, you know, five or six key pieces of criteria. How often are they doing it? What subjects are they actually coaching on? How good is the skill that they're using? And this one, which is often overlooked, how are they enacting outcomes from that coaching? Because a coaching conversation is great. People leave there feeling confident, sometimes more competent. But how do they actually enable the rep to go and start deploying that strategy? And then lastly, how do they then follow up on that coaching? So once the rep's gone and done that, how do we now get them back in a room and go, let's talk about what actually happened and the results that, that you generated from doing this. If you think about what coaching ultimately is, it's shifting the responsibility of the thinking into the person that you're coaching. So by definition, what that does is it changes the way they think about not just that problem, but every single problem they encounter in their life. So a really good example of this, Mo, is, is if you came to me now and said, Aaron, 
kind of borrow your scissors. The temptation for the managers to turn around and go, yeah, they're in the third drawer down in the kitchen. And the manager and the rep goes and gets them, uses the scissors, put them back, puts them back, and they've not learned anything. They're not responsible for that learning. But if I was to take that moment to go, well, where do you think I keep the scissors? And you said, oh, in the kitchen. And I said, well, whereabouts in the kitchen? And you said, probably in the drawers. And I said, well, which drawer? And you said, cutlery top drawer, tea towel second drawer, probably the third drawer down. And I said, okay, great, now go and have a look. And you found the scissors there. You've now created a thought pattern that is incredibly valuable. So the next time you want to look for something, you say, I wonder where Aaron keeps his hairdryer. You don't come to me and go, where's your hairdryer? You go, where would I keep my hairdryer? So you're creating responsibility around thinking about a problem and then by definition, how to solve every problem in the world, which seems crazy. But think about what you get back from that. You get time back as a manager. You get more, more effective people, more confident people, more motivated people, less time. When people do come to you with a problem, they've already gone through a huge thought process. So the problem's really defined. And all you need to do now is ask a couple of questions to get the outcome that you want. Now, if you think about that, what the business has to do is to skill the right people to be able to do that effectively and then monitor that and then make sure that something actionable is happening out the back of it. And lastly, coach to performance. Stop coaching conversations for the sake of coaching conversations. Just coach to performance. I'm pretty sure Messi doesn't sit there asking his coaches uh, about, you know, a bloody paella that he cooked last night. You know, he talks about performance. Let's keep coaching to performance. And then not a minute is wasted. I'm writing notes, by the way, right? So I, I love I love these kind of conversations where where I learn, but also I get confirmation on things. So I, I'm really glad I asked this question. I know it's a massive question, Aaron, that we we could talk for hours on, and it's an area that you know I, I constantly talk with um, you know salespeople as well as founders on. Um, so let's let's just summarize that, right? So number one, coaching is a language. It's not an, it's not an in the moment thing. It's, it's a, it's a culture. It's, it's, it's something that's embedded as part of the business. Secondly, really important, right? So how do we know coaching is a language? Well, let me explain to you, right? If I coached you for long enough and you'd never been coached before in your life, and then someone come and asked you a question, there's a strong chance you'd start coaching them because Mm -hmm. osmatically that's what you've taken on. So it's like being in a bloody Indonesian prison when you've been caught drug smuggling and you just happen to take the language on and then you start speaking Indonesian to other people. That's exactly how a language works, is that even if you've never been coached before, if you've been coached, sorry, if you've been coached enough and you've never learned the principles of coaching, you will naturally start coaching other people, which is the definition of a language. Makes complete sense. And that's and that kind of links to one of the areas you talked about, which was, you know, the fact that this is actually evergreen, right? This is, it's something that you'll bring to the rest of your life. In fact, it's it's less about what you know, and it's more about how you think and how you think about a situation, which in my view, and from all the research I've done in neuroscience, I have that background. Actually, that's something that I believe is start, it's, it's eroding in our in our society, right? It's it's more about what we know and some of that will be false information, but it's how you think, especially with that plethora of information, you're helping buyers learn how to think, how to assess which information is probably the right information. How should they test out whether, you know, another supplier comes in with a claim, you know, what are the questions they should be asking to uncover whether that claim is true or false? So it's how we think that's really important. So I totally get that. And the other thing you talked about, which was really, really intriguing was, training the managers to become coaches. So they will need to be certified, whether that's their own certification or an external one, but they need to be certified for there to be a standard as to how they are coaching rather than a haphazard approach to coaching, which I thought was really important. The other one is a mechanism to be able to observe how that coaching is manifesting, how those skills are manifesting in the calls in the sales meetings and interactions so that you can then gather data, which then connects to enacting on the outcomes right so you know how is that actually changing the outcomes of those conversations is it improving that so that you can then follow up on the coaching and bring it back to those coaching sessions and say right what have you observed what is the experience how has that worked out for you so that you can then iterate that and say right net going forward these are the other things that we would help improve on or how they should improve etc so i thought there was a full circle element and process to what you described that was very very powerful did i capture that all correctly Aaron? yeah and, and, and you've some the, the ending there's the key part is that you've got to close the loop on the competency because so many coaching conversations happen and they're open-ended and no one's actually going right you're now good at this you've done it what should we work on next 
Um, but yeah, really well summarized. Good. Yeah, good. I I I hope our viewers and listeners take 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 notes on that because that was very very important. Because it's not just it's not just coaching at a business level; it's coaching at a personal level as well, right? I mean, you've got to have almost the same mechanisms to to be able to coach yourself. So even if even if your business is not investing in in coaching you, you can invest in yourself. Whether that's some of it you do yourself or you go to someone else to help you with that, you can also assess those their coaching approach to see, is it actually in line with that process that you just that you just shared and described there? And therefore, will it be effective for yourself? So I thought that was really, really, really interesting what you shared there. I wish we would have more time uh, and uh, discuss a whole heap of areas that I would love to discuss with you. But 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 sadly, we've run out of time. And, you know, maybe if, if we get feedback from the community, and I think we will, we can potentially have you on, uh, have you on again in the show if you're open to that, Eric. I'd love to, yeah. Love talking about this stuff. I love everything to do with selling and sales. So yeah, more than happy to jump back on. Good, good. Well, there's there's a couple of questions I want to ask you, which I ask all of our guests that come on the show. Uh, actually, there's one main one, which is what three books would you recommend that our viewers and listeners should read? Or you might say, um, you know, which three people who know their stuff should our viewers and listeners make sure that they follow to understand the future of selling you first got to understand the past of selling yeah so i call it the holy trinity of books there's three books that i always recommend people read to get a real well-rounded view of selling but also how selling has changed over the years because the past will inform the future the first one is where it all started which was neil rackham's 1988 book spin selling if you've not read that book, it's like a staple, right? You, you, you've got to read that book because the principles around questioning are still exactly the same today as they were. 35,000 sales calls over the course of 12 years. It was the biggest study that was ever done in the history of selling. The second book I'd read is Never Split the Difference because it's, it's the human behavior and that's never going to change. It doesn't matter whether you're selling in a different country, different culture, or whether you're selling in 100 years time. The way the human brain works is always going to be the same. It's a great book and there's tons of practical, actionable tips at the back of that. The other one's a controversial one because in, to a degree, it's helped kind of create this mess, but it's also where the market's moving, which is The Challenger Cell. I think The Challenger Cell is a really, really good book for teaching you to be a challenger-led salesperson, but at the same time, how insight and information is actually going to change the way that we sell going forward. So it's less about the insight and the information you give now. It's more about how you help curate that insight and information for the customer. Those three books have something very interesting in common. They were not written by salespeople. They were written by researchers and analysts. And I think that's the point. Before those books, or certainly before spin selling, it was just a load of hints and tips on how to sell and a load of conventional wisdom that had been passed down. Each one of those books actually smashes conventional wisdom and actually gets to the research, the data and the truth. So they're the three books that I'd recommend. If I was yeah, recommend well. to follow anyone, it would be you, my dear man. I recommend that all of the listeners or anyone watching this in my network who eventually watch it, give you a follow and, uh, and like your content as well. That's really kind of you. You didn't have to say that, but that's, that's I really kind of you. But I, but I believe it. So No, thank you for that. And, and Aaron, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I, I've learned a ton, right? I mean, and I know from, that's always valuable. In fact, when I spoke to buyers, you know, what, what was something that made you buy from someone else or ingratiate yourself on the salesperson? One of the things they said was, I learned from this person. I learned something new, a new perspective. So I know how valuable that is, both from a personal level and a neuroscience level. So thank you for doing so. How can our viewers and listeners learn more about you, Aaron, and get in touch with you? Well, I think I've made it pretty clear through this conversation that I'm on LinkedIn. Aaron Evans Enablement is the best way of finding me or just type in Aaron Evans. I work for an organization called Flow State. If you want um, just some insight, I'm not going to sell you anything. If you want some insight on Flow State and how we're helping customers and maybe we can give you some practical tips as well, feel free to reach out to flowstatesales.co.uk. Um, they're probably the best ways of getting hold of me and uh, I'm constantly posting daily tips on LinkedIn as well so feel free to get involved with those. Thank you again Aaron for coming on the show I really enjoyed this discussion uh, and for sharing freely what you did I, I know that our viewers and listeners will get a ton of value from what you share so thank you again. My pleasure thank you very much for having me on I've really enjoyed it. Great so this is Moe Damin signing out um, if you are interested anyone listening or watching this if you are interested in understanding how we how to make sales more human how to look at the science 
uh, uh, behind, you know, what is it that makes people make decisions and how you can adapt your sales approach to actually work with your buyer's biology, not against it, then feel free to connect with me, link in the show notes. Until the next episode, thank you, everyone.